On today's show, food. We live in Illinois, which is the capital of the Corn Belt, and many people probably think that means we grow a lot of food. But the reality is that all these miles of farm fields you see stretching across the horizon are growing just two crops, soybeans and corn. Most of that soy and corn is used for industrial purposes or as food for livestock. So we really don't grow much food in this rich, dark prairie soil. And a lot of people think it's wrong that we buy our food from farms thousands of miles away or even in other countries. And they're trying to find a new way. And that's what we'll be talking about today on Community Forum. And who doesn't want to talk about food? That's the best topic we can talk about, right? Except that there are a lot of complications about food, and I think we're going to get into some of those today here on Community Forum. Hi, I'm Ken Davis, and thanks for joining us today. Tara Brockman is with us. Tara Brockman will be with us throughout the half hour today. And uh, Tara Brockman is a, an author and also the founder of The Land Connection in Evanston. Welcome to Community Forum. Thanks, Ken. Glad to have you here. So your family has been in farming for a while. Yeah. Like how many years? <laughs> My father's side of the family, about five generations. Uh, that would be from the mid to late 1800s in central Illinois. And so, my mom's side, probably for generations before that, in southern Italy as wow. landless peasants, basically. So you, you have a little perspective on mm -hmm. farming in Illinois. You, mm -hmm. You've been doing it for a while. Is farming in Illinois, he says, a loaded question, is it any different today than it was, say, 20, 30 years ago? It's, uh, I would say the change happened more like 50 years ago. It happened after World War II and probably took 10 or 20 years to really get fully uh, mechanized, chemicalized, industrialized, so that I would say by 30 years ago or so, as you said, we were in a very different um, kind of agriculture than has ever been practiced on Earth. We just sort of touched on it in that little opening montage there about uh, soybeans and corn and that uh, you'd really you'd really have to drive pretty far in Illinois to find a, a farm field that doesn't have one of those two crops in it. In general, why is that? How did that happen? Yeah, that, that's I a mean, question that's that we a could go into huge question, amounts but let's, of let's, let's sort of try uh, political to, and structural yeah, things that, that, the organic onion that made it. Yeah. But what you say is true, and we do grow a few other things in Illinois. Um, uh, where I'm from, between Peoria and Bloomington, uh, the Morton, Illinois area is famous actually because there's a very large Libby's pumpkin cannery uh, right yes, there. The but it's still yeah. hard to find it. If you're just driving around country roads, you will really have to search. It's like the Where's Waldo to find the pumpkin field because they're surrounded by corn and soybean fields. So we do grow a fair number of pumpkins in Illinois as well as apparently horseradish, although I've never seen a field of <laughs> horseradish. Um, but in Illinois, we can grow just about anything that grows in a temperate climate. Um, why are we growing only corn and soybeans is a, is a question you can read books on. But it's structural and political uh, policy decisions were made during the 60s and 70s that led us where we are today that really reward people who grow these commodity crops, make it very easy, simple, and safe and secure because of the subsidies. And if you go out on your own and say, I'm going to grow green beans or I'm going to grow potatoes, um, you're open to a lot of risk and there aren't a lot of safety nets at all for you. And it's just hard. It's a lot harder. I guess it's really hard for, for some people, myself included, to just kind of get your hands around this. I mean, what is, let's just take corn. That's, that's the big thing, right? We're the corn belt. We're in the middle of the corn belt. What is all that corn used for? I mean, I can eat only so many corn on the cobs in one year. I don't well, know. The thing is, you don't even eat that, though. The, the, <laughs> what you're seeing growing in those pictures right. we just looked at is is not the sweet corn. You know, if you did go pick some of it right now in its sort of a green, not yet hard stage, and boil it up, you'd find it very starchy, very unpalatable. Um, it's it's not um, it, it's not the kind of sweet corn that we're used to eating off the cob. And so, in fact, it's. Um, it's primarily used for animal feed and secondarily then for feedstocks for industry, various, um, it's broken down into components that are used both in food, often we say junk food, you know, processed food mm -hmm. stuffs, and also for industry, components for industry. And until recently, a lot of it, a fair bit of it was going for ethanol. So it was being used for, for fuel. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it would feed car engines, it would feed factories, mm -hmm. it would feed animals, but really it doesn't feed you or me. 
And that's pretty weird to think about a, a state where um, our soil is probably some of the best soil in the world and, and it can support real food. So as you say, the, we, we got there because of, because of policy issues, not because of agricultural issues, not because of natural processes that led us there. No, kind of unnatural processes. Very unnatural <laughs> processes. Fact. So, so let's, just, let's, just, yeah. let's also look at, at, at soybeans too. That's another, that's another massive crop. Where do soybeans go? What do they get used for? You know, soybeans is similar. It's actually really important in animal feed because it is high protein. And so if you're feeding pretty much anything, chickens, pigs, um, cows, uh, it's the corn that has the high calorie content. It's the soybeans that have the high protein content. And you mix them together and you can make animals grow really big, really fast and really fat. So that's what we want and that's what we do. Soybeans are also for industry. You probably heard soy-based inks and, and other things. More and more we're seeing soy yeah. this and soy that. Mm -hmm. So it's, but it, but it again, it's not being used per se as, you know, oh, here's a nice plate of soy. Uh, <laughs> it's not being used directly as food. It's, it's coming no. to us even in food kind of indirectly. It's interesting, you know, because we could be, all those soybean fields could be in um, edible soybeans. Edamame is what we use the term, the Japanese word, edamame, fresh green soybeans. Mm -hmm. It would be super simple. You, you have your same equipment, you have your same, you know, style of, of planting your crop and harvesting your crop. You know, harvesting's a little different, but it would be for something that we could actually have on our table as a green vegetable. It wouldn't be that hard to switch over. It's a little bit of a digression I guess from our from our actual conversation but I just find it fascinating that we we seem to grow so much um, biomass to feed animals mm. because the the actual cost to the planet of raising beef and cattle is just so much higher than we actually think it is. Yeah, you know, the diet for a small planet, which is now a decades, decades old book, but unfortunately is still relevant. Mm -hmm. And her points in there are still well made. Um, that the amount of protein you get from animals, you know, the amount of calories you feed into it and land you use for that for animal protein is um, not a really good way to do it. It's things. not a good trade off. Yeah. 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 So let's talk about where where we go from here. You and your family, uh, in in your family farm, you're trying to do something a little bit differently. Yeah, and we could even go back a little to your earlier question about how many generations, mm -hmm. because it wasn't that many generations ago. It was my grandparents' generation and throughout most of their lives that um, they grew... Uh, uh, 10 or 12 different crops, you know. They, they grew uh, corn, soybeans came a little later, but wheat, oats, hay, alfalfa, various grass mixtures for forage for the animals. And then they grew, uh, you know, uh, chickens, ducks, geese, pigs, cows. Um, they had the horses for, for the um, pulling the tractors and whatnot. But um, all that, you know, switched. And when they were growing that stuff, they had a local food system. That food fed their family, it fed their community, and it went right on the train from their little town of Danforth. Actually, uh, my grandparents' farm, I-57 cuts right through it. And it went right along the train tracks. And it came into Chicago every day, cream from my grandparents' farm was put on the milk train and it came to Chicago. You guys had fresh cream from the farm in wow. Chicago and it wasn't that hard. Those trains stopped at every small town and things got put on it, you know, eggs, whatever, and it came to the city. It's not rocket science, you know, it's not, you know, we had a local food system and we were not dependent on foreign countries for our food at that point. And within a couple generations, everything changed. And that's what I find so fascinating about this is th is that we're kind of fed this diet, uh, not to, to force too much of an analogy here, but we're we're fed this diet of information that the only way we can sustain life on the planet is by doing this kind of very intensive industrialized kind of uh, of agriculture that 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 those days are past you can't right. just have a whole bunch of people doing a whole lot of right. chaotic little things right. you have to you have to grow these giant monocultures and and everything has to be done in a very organized way but it really does seem that the beneficiaries of that are the people who are making all the money yeah. making that happen. That's a, the good question to ask is who benefits? You know, who's telling you this? Follow who's, the money. Who's selling you this little bill of goods here and who's benefiting from it? And if you trace that, which is pretty easy to do, you see who's benefiting. And it's not the farmer on the ground. It's not, uh, you know, I know I, I'm surrounded by neighbors who, who farm corn 
and corn and soybeans. And they do it because there's been generations of experts from the University of Illinois, from the government, everyone telling them what to do and what's right and what's efficient. And it's only efficient in the narrowest terms possible, and they're not benefiting from it. In fact, they'd all be out of business except for the subsidies. So uh, what was the question? Well, <laughs> that, that, that is the question, isn't it? Is it? Partly it's how did we get here? And we got here because of a combination of, of business interests and and sort of their hand in glove partners with agricultural academics right. saying that this is the way to go right. and so this is what we all kind of believe right. now. And, and you, we've heard it so many times, it's true, they, and they have a very efficient um, a mouthpiece of, of, of having the message, and the message is always uh, American farmers or you know, Illinois farmers feed the world. Mm -hmm. And we've heard this so many times our entire lives that mm -hmm. we all sort of take it as truth. In fact, it's not the truth. Uh, we're not feeding the world. We're feeding car engines and factories and animals for our stakes in this country. So the, so the question then is, is it possible? Is it is it possible to have a more sustainable agriculture? I mean, can, yeah. I don't know if it's going backward or if it's going no, forward. No, it's at this going point. forward. I, I, I always hesitate. People think and, and they've been told that that we're you know going back and that we're you know wanting people to go back to the Gutenberg press or something. That's not true. It's not this. You could, as you are doing yourself on your family mm -hmm. farm, it is possible mm -hmm. to raise real food that mm -hmm. people actually eat, like yes. a few days after you pull it out of the ground. In fact, right now my brother is harvesting um, um, out of his 600 varieties of vegetables that he's growing on about 12 acres, and he's harvesting right now as we speak for the local CSA in Bloomington, Illinois, where those customers will get their seven to nine different vegetables in their share this evening. So it's being picked as we speak, and it'll be delivered to them in a matter of hours. A CSA mm -hmm. is a community supported agriculture and that works by I actually like to call it subscription farming because that's a lot more obvious what it is you're taking out a subscription just like a magazine but instead of getting your time magazine every week you're getting a basket or a bag of a box of in my brother's case seven to nine different vegetables and you pay for it ahead of time like you do with a subscription so in so the, the winter the farmer you pay, knows mm -hmm. that he's got his subscribers his, yeah yeah <laughs> well as it as it just so happens we uh took a, a trip up to ravenswood just a couple of days ago uh a, another organization angelic organics uh, has been doing this for quite a few years now and uh, we talked with uh, the gentleman who is the host in Ravenswood. He's been doing this for about 20 years. Let's take a look at what we found out when we went up there to his house. This is Tom Melvin. He lives in Ravenswood. And his home is a host site for a community-supported agriculture drop. What that means is in the middle of the night, a farmer from out near Rockford comes by and drops off boxes of fresh fruit and vegetables in Tom's garage. Then the neighbors come by later on and pick them up. Tom says he's proud to be a part of Angelic Organics CSA. Uh well, it's, it's a farm, a family farm that uh, has been in uh, uh, east of Rockford uh, um, all of John Peterson's life. I mean, this was his family farm, and uh, he, uh, along with uh, friends, uh, established this as a, as a working organic farm. He's, he's developed it into a community-supported agricultural uh, farm, such that uh, we now have, um, oh, maybe... 10 plus drop sites within the city and, and uh, of which this is one, uh, each of them hosting uh, some 70 families picking up vegetables on a weekly basis. So why is, why is community sustainable agriculture, these drop-off points, why are they important? Well, it's, it's, it's just important that we really uh, assume responsibility for this, you know, our, our own food here, that we don't uh, relegate it to a to uh, you know the corporate world, um, we need to to, uh, to to be able to do everything really, uh, you know, and uh, and among uh, along with that is growing food and understanding where it comes from, and and, uh, um, and being more in touch with the seasons. That all all sort of things that uh, it, it's a shame to lose touch. What, what's what do we got this week? What's what's in the what's in the boxes this week? Well, I haven't looked there. I got my box in there today, uh, but I would assume it's you know more sweet onions, uh, various uh, leafy greens, cucumbers, zucchinis are coming along and already huge. 
a um, lot of radishes and turnips, carrots, uh, we've got dill, basil, uh, other herbs perhaps. I think today we think a lot about carbon footprints and we know that everything has a carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. Even a tomato has a carbon footprint. Yeah, well, I, I don't buy tomatoes in the winter when they're shipped in. They're just tasteless anyway in the supermarket. And so I'll just hold off and wait till the, they taste great when I get them fresh. And, uh, and I think that, the, you know, there's, uh, we need to, need to eat seasonally as well that way. And, and it's all the healthier. Um, and uh, so... Haven't people kind of forgotten how to eat seasonally? I mean, people have grown up not even, not even understanding that there is a season to food. Yeah, well, they have, unfortunately, uh, I would say, you know, uh, but um, uh, it's not hard to relearn. It's in our, it's in our makeup, you know. We, we, we long for that. And, 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 of course, the health aspect is great. I mean, who wants to eat a processed food when one can eat a, a whole food? While we were visiting Tom Melvin's host site, several of his neighbors, all of them shareholders in Angelic Organics Community Supported Agriculture, showed up for their weekly allotments of fruits and veggies. One of them was Lynn Danford. She empties the boxes so they can be recycled and then she repacks the food in cloth bags for the bicycle trip home. I like to buy food that's, um, that's grown carefully without too many um, pesticides and um, other things added. Um, and I like to buy food that doesn't require a lot of fuel to transport it. I would rather buy food that's locally grown in season than to buy watermelons that are coming from Mexico in the winter. It's okay for me not to eat watermelons in the winter um, and to eat locally grown food. And I, I cook in that ways. I cook in a way that um, I'm using the foods that are seasonal and they taste better and they're more nutritious. Um, but that it's supporting local farmers um, is equally important. Um, I feel like that's making a contribution to um, our local economy and um, it just feels right to me. And away she goes, pedaling off into the distance with her nutritious food ready for whatever she can make with that. You're watching Community Forum on Can TV. I'm Ken Davis, thanks for joining us today. Our guest is Tara Brockman here in the studio. Tara Brockman is with the uh, Land Connection uh, and uh, as an author, uh, well, we, we ought to talk about your book, but first of all, just, just deal with this for me, this thing about uh, the, this topic that sort of came up several times in our visit up to uh, Tom's place in Ravenswood. Um, have people really kind of gotten away from this notion of seasonality in food? I mean, it just, it's like everything's available all the time, no matter what, no matter where. Yeah, I think we've gotten away from it, and I think we're getting back to it. I actually think there is a groundswell of a movement, um, largely thanks to Michael Pollan and his books, um, The Omnivore's Dilemma and, and others, that, um, that people are beginning to, even though we all grew up, most of us grew up, going into a grocery store and doesn't matter what time of year we saw lemons and limes and apples and pears and grapes and tomatoes it didn't matter when it was but after a while after you've had a real tomato or a real pear in season and you go in you don't want that thing anymore it's <laughs> even if it's cheap you don't want it well and that also ties into this notion that that there's a sort of a massive public education going on with people to learn that everything doesn't have to be exactly perfect. <laughs> every tomato, every apple doesn't have to be exactly like a like it should it's posing for an ad or something. In fact I think there's a, a direct sort of inverse relationship between how good it looks and how perfect and uniform it is and how bad it tastes. Mm -hmm. And I actually think if we could start to tell people that if you go for the ugliest, you know, the most misshapen, <laughs> the maybe little soft brown spot on it, mm -hmm. but Actually, if you listen to your nose, you can't really yeah. do that, but if you smell uh -huh. the, uh, a fruit or a vegetable, it actually has a smell, then you know it's going to taste good. But if you go in the store and go in the produce section, most yeah. often you don't smell a thing. Yeah. Yeah. You walk by all those what should be very aromatic, like nectarines or peaches, and you smell nothing. Then That's again, really why yeah. should you even bother to eat it? And there are actually is scientific uh, data now from our food scientist friends who say that taste equals nutrition. And if it doesn't taste good, there's no nutrition. 
So if you're buying a tasteless tomato, it doesn't have X units of vitamin C, vitamin mm -hmm. A, like they tell you in the FDA thing. It has almost nothing. There was a segment you did on the radio a little while ago where you were talking about being at a, uh, I don't know, you have to tell the story, but be, being at a banquet or something and being served a tomato <laughs> and, and thinking about where it came from <laughs> and where you were, this, what was that? Actually, remember? I think that was my friend Sandra Stuttengraber, oh, who's yeah, also yeah. an author, and she came to Central Illinois at this time of year when tomatoes mm -hmm. are, you know, at their height of their peak, peak of taste and, and nutrition, and, and she went to a, it was a uh, wedding banquet and there were these tasteless tomatoes and she knew that there were people around her, even just family gardens, raising tomatoes. She was like, why am I being served something probably from thousands of miles away with no taste? And uh, you know, the answer, you know, the answer is complicated, but, but more and more people are starting to want to grow local food because the consumers want to eat local food. Yeah. So it's one of those things that kind of ratchets up and we need to devote more farmland to this kind of food. We need to train more farmers to grow it. And then we need to let people know how they can get it through a CSA, for example. Or, or, or another example is farmers markets. Yeah. And I know your family's involved with yeah. Evanston. You're, yeah. You supply the market in Evanston. There are a lot of other farmers markets going on all over the city. Uh, one of the most successful is the Green City uh, farmers market. And uh, we, took a, we took a little trip down there the other day to see what was going on. And there were a lot of little ugly tomatoes there, but they sure smelled good. Let's watch this. <laughs> We're Chicago's only truly green farmer's market. We support uh, local farmers that abide by s local sustainable agricultural practices. So all the farmers that you'll see here uh, come within about 300 miles and ultimately they support preserving the land and passing that down from generation to generation. Sure, there's farmers all across the country of the United States, but what we ultimately support here is uh, supporting farmers that uh, come within the Midwest region, uh, abide by local sustainable practices, meaning that uh, they take care of the land, they preserve the soil, they follow uh, pest control management. And the difference that the products that they bring to Green City Market are very different from what you'll find at the local grocery store chains. The, uh, the food tastes better. It, uh, it's much better for you. Our farmers are out the morning before they come to Green City Market picking the things that you'll find for sale here at our market. What do you mean when you say local? Well, I was just at uh, one of our grocery stores yesterday, curious to see where their blueberries and cherries were coming from. And I noticed on uh, the products that had labels, the things were coming as far as chili, and uh, in the United States, uh, I saw cherries that were coming from the Northwest states. And folks don't understand that a lot of that produce uh, sometimes has already been picked two to three weeks before it arrives to a grocery store for them to purchase. Now that's very different from what you'll see at Green City Market. But today, for example, we're highlighting carrots. We're having an event called a, a Carrot Fest, which falls in with a monthly program we have called Savor the Seasons. And it highlights a particular product at the very height of its taste and availability at the market. Uh, people don't realize there's over 20 varieties of carrots available for sale in the Midwest, many of them available here for the Green City Market shoppers. So we'll be uh, highlighting that particular item, for example, today. I mean, I don't think most people know there is more than one variety. Sure. And they come in every kind of color, everything from orange to white, yellow and purple. But uh, another program that we're featuring this year is called the Heirloom and Heritage Preservation Project. We want to encourage shoppers to come to Green City Market and seek out these unique items. There are so many cool varieties of tomatoes, cucumbers, cherries, blueberries, I could go on forever. And folks don't realize that so many of these products are close to becoming extinct. You know, when you think of an extinct animal, everybody thinks of dinosaurs, but there's actually hundreds of varieties of fruits and vegetables that are extremely close to becoming extinct and no longer available on our plates. So we are, that's the foundation program that we'll be offering at Green City Market this year. And I hope everyone comes out and looks for the giant H signs that we have at the farmer's bins that designate that this is an heirloom or heritage product and encourage people to try to uh, sample those things, take them home and cook them themselves. 
So what what would we find typically here on? I mean, this is we're here on a, on the at the end of July. What what typically would we find here in July and August? Well, you know, every season's a little bit different, and uh, for 2009, we're finding that it's been a little cooler. The season is running actually a little bit later. So uh, I, you know, every market date is an adventure, and I tell people to come in with an open mind because you're never exactly sure what you're going to find that day. So there's always some sort of adventure at Green City Market every day. And Green City is not the only market. There are lots of them. They're all over the suburbs and there are many others in the city and new ones starting every day. So do that. Go out and enjoy some fresh fruit and fresh vegetables being brought right to you from the farm. Tara Brockman is our guest today on Community Forum. My name is Ken Davis, and we're talking about food, locally grown, locally eaten. <laughs> That's the best kind of food is locally eaten. And, um, you know, the, when we were watching that, uh, you, you had mentioned Michael Pollan earlier in uh, his, uh, his earlier book, The Botany of Desire. He talks about the fact that we just lose a lot of species, a lot of... Uh, uh, plants just because they aren't as um, attractive to us as people and that's kind of what they're talking about there. Right, yeah, he specifically talked about all the varieties of apples and we've lost already, there used to be 1,300 varieties of apples in this country, something like that, and now we have Red Delicious, which yeah. isn't delicious, <laughs> you know, and a couple but others. But it's red. Yeah, it's very it's red. <laughs> so Tara, you, you've, uh, you're transitioning yourself into being an author and you've just written about your family yeah. and uh, tell us a little bit about the book it's just coming out right yeah it should be out within days actually and it's called the seasons on henry's farm and henry is my brother who raises all those 650 varieties of vegetables in central mm -hmm. illinois and you know you know people say well it's a throwback and you can't do this but on 10 or 12 acres he's able after doing this for 16 years now um, and has a great market in Evanston he's able to make a living just by being a farmer he doesn't have to have a second job like many of our farmers do and you've documented this in yeah the book. so the book so. goes through 52 seasons 52 <laughs> seasons of farming and, and food. Tara thanks so much for being with us today on Community Farm I really appreciate it I really enjoyed talking with you um, eat better. <laughs> you can do it. It's not hard. So thanks for joining us today. You've been watching Can TV's Community Forum. It's a community service of Can TV, and you can tune into Community Forum for local issues and concerns every Saturday from eight to nine p.m. right here on Can TV 21. I'm Ken Davis, and once again, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.